this session, uh, I'm the chair of this session, so I'd like to introduce myself. <laughs> I've known myself for some 55 years. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I'm also an evangelical theologian, and a number of you know that I embrace a rather heretical approach to things, as Carol, <laughs> as Carol Hill has pointed out in the last session. Um, and let, let me give you a little insight on my life. If there's one question in the Q&A that gets Denny's stomach knotted, and you know what it is, what about Romans 5? The sin-death problem, indeed, it's a really challenging problem. So, All right, I was going to confess my sins here. I um, always like to put a little bit of personal story in there. Creation Science Dialogue, winter 1981. This is the Young Earth Creationist Journal in the province of Alberta, where I come from. And, of course, there's one of my proudest publications. And you'll notice uh, I've been through university, but my training was that of filling teeth as opposed to doing biblical exegesis and evolutionary biology. Well, take a look at the title of this. And the reason I present this is this, for those I, you know, may disagree with me, I, I have that history. I'm utterly empathetic of it. Look at the title, Philosophy. Now, you know what philosophy we're talking about? Evolutionary philosophy. Evolution is just a philosophy versus science, the true science. And you know what science we're talking about? Creation science. And I conclude this section, oh, I'm such an evangelical. I challenge, right? You know, I challenge anyone who prides in their objectivity. Do you see the, the positivist there, boy? The po the, to, their, objective, uh, pardon me, their objectivity to seriously entertain great splint infinitive dentist, to seriously entertain scientific creationism, it may well be the most important study of your life. And indeed, it had a huge impact on my life. I walked out of medical school in 1983 to become a creation scientist. Part of the story is, is when I'm on my knees, I had a sense that before I go down to El Cajon and ICR, and I wrote my letters to Morris and Gish, I just had this sense I should do something in Genesis 1 to 11 before I get there. So here is my diary, registration day, Regent College at Vancouver. Go study with Bruce Waltke and J.I. Packer. I'm 30 years of age. Every young man needs a grand plan. The grand plan to declare, declare absolute and pure hell on the theory. Any of you guys ever been there? Well, what happened along the way? Um, it was quite a challenge starting getting exposed to what goes on in the early chapters of Genesis. And at the same time, did some evolutionary biology. And so I come to the conclusion, and you've probably seen that out there. Sorry for the self-serving slide, but here's where, 25 years later, I love Jesus and I accept evolution. If I have to summarize my spiritual journey through this all, my love for the Lord Jesus hasn't changed one iota through this process. My understanding of what do you do with the Word of God in the early chapters, which indeed is very challenging, has certainly changed. And of course, I also did that PhD in evolutionary biology, which, by the way, I entered as a skeptic. You're probably familiar with Kirk Wise and now uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus Ross, who's at Liberty. I mean, we had the image. We're going to attack the, the evolutionary establishment. But the one twist that I have different from these guys is I did the text before I got there. Okay, some terms and definitions before we get to try an attempt on solving this. Now, the term theistic evolution is out there, and if you want to use that term, that's great. The problem, I'm not crazy about the word theistic. It takes so many different spins, like panentheism and, and, a, and sort of a physicalism, pantheism. Um, and I didn't coin the term. Um, got it off the ASA Listler in the mid-90s. Uh, and here's the definition of how I approach things. Notice my Trinitarianism. The Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit created the universe and life. Oh, and I know this is where it gets exciting including human life, through and ordained. It's not a mistake, the process. We have to decouple evolutionary biology from the metaphysical stuff that Dawkins attaches to it. And he's as much a believer as anyone else is in the room with regards to their ultimate metaphysical beliefs. Through an ordained, not a mistake, sustained, no, this isn't deism, God is here sustaining every element. And of course, this is the very volatile term, design reflecting, and I'm going to use it in the biblical traditional sense, that the heavens indeed declare the glory of God. Hits you like a ton of bricks. In other words, that nature reflects design as opposed to the debate of how design got there. Evolutionary process. 
one of the easiest ways to understand this, and again, I didn't coin this, this has been around for a while, to make sense of this, go back to the womb. How did we get created? Do we think of the Lord coming out of heaven and attaching an arm, attaching a leg? No, we think of God, think of Psalm 139, knit us together, fearfully and wonderfully made. There's your ID, your designed statement through natural processes. And so that's the way I look at the evolution of life, his process through which the world has been created for his glory. Now, here's a term, and this is maybe where the lecture may stop for a number of you. The term scientific concordism. It is the assumption that God revealed scientific facts in the Bible thousands of years through the Holy Spirit before their discovery by modern science. In other words, as Henry Morris says, that the Bible is indeed a book of science. Now, that is an extremely reasonable position. God, after all, is the author of his word and he's the creator of his works, you think the two would align. In other words, correspond or accord. And this is where we get the term concordism. But here's the question. As I said, it may be this is where the lecture stops for a few people. I want to ask the question, but is it true? Is scientific concordism an aspect of the word of God? And what happened to me with regards to graduate school and here's my answer. And if you were in the first session with Paul Seeley, he did a wonderful presentation of the ancient understanding of nature. We see a three-tier universe in the scriptures. We don't have to go very far into the scriptures. You just have to go to the second day of creation. God created a rakia, a hard, firm surface to lift the waters above from waters below. And all of a sudden you're saying, what do you make of that? Well, it's a simple move. When Jesus talks to you, does the Lord not come down to your level and accommodate, meet you exactly where you're at. So when it comes to the spirit of God inspiring the ancient Near Eastern peoples, the biblical peoples and the prophets, he comes down or accommodates to the level. He uses an ancient understanding of the world. So in other words, it's an ancient phenomenological perspective. What they saw, they truly believed there was a firmament up there, as Paul presented in the earlier presentation. And, then, and indeed, this is the best science of the day. And again, Paul you know, presented a number of different uh, cultures in which it's there. And in particular, it is ancient science. Well, this should create a little bit of attention. What do we make of the Holy Spirit using an ancient science? And I think it's a pretty easy move to suggest um, that there is a message within the text and there's an incidental aspect. In other words, what we have within the text is like a glass. It really doesn't matter whether the glass is plastic, ceramic, or whatever. But it is, and if I'll use the metaphor, the living waters. It's the message. It's the stuff that changes people's lives. It is the divine theology, and yes, I'm an errantist of the highest order. It is the inerrant word of God that changes lives. And... Within the text, we have an ancient science, which is an ancient phenomenological perspective. Well, here's the greatest passage. We sing this in our, my church all the time. I love Philippians 10, the kenotic passage, kenosis, to pour out the mystery, the ultimate mystery, that God became flesh in Jesus Christ. And of course, you know the verse. At the name of Jesus, every tongue shall confess and knee bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think that's easy to pick up in terms of the central message. And is Lord where? In heaven, and under the earth. Do you know what the actual Greek is? It's not under the earth. It's not hupogeis. It's actually kata kathonios. And of course, I put a hyphen in there. The kathonic realm, the subterranean world. In other words, there's a world in there in kata. Think of catabolic processes, you biochemists. Breakdown. That's the, that's the preposition for uh, breakdown. So what we see here within the word of God Inspired by the Holy Spirit, making an accommodative move, coming down to their level to go ahead and get across a message that's very important, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of this amazing, amazing universe. All right. In other words, we have an underworld as opposed to just under the earth, the three-tier universe. Heaven, earth, and the underworld within the text, and I'm utterly unapologetic. What I will do is submit to the words of the text, then shape my hermeneutics and my theology. All right. That's some of the setting up of the argument, let's get on to the sin-death problem, which is indeed quite a challenge. No doubt about it. Genesis 2, 17 and 3, 9. For when you, Adam, eat of the tree, you shall surely die. And for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. This is physical death, not spiritual death. 
And I understand some of the moves on why 